right, welcome, welcome. Uh, ben, really nice to have you here today. Um, and I'm gonna ask you to introduce yourself in just a moment, but just to kind of give the audience a little bit of a um, uh, context. So you and I connected via LinkedIn, which I love the platform for that. So I think it's always great to connect with like-minded individuals and you create some amazing content. And I was like, I gotta talk to this guy. Like we gotta have a conversation, you know, you coming from, from being based in the US and then coming from the HR background and just the variety of experience that you had. I think we're gonna have a really nice discussion about some topics we genuinely care about. So let's go ahead and dive right in. Um, tell us a little bit about about kind of who you are, a little bit more about your background, and then we'll get to the chat. Awesome, absolutely. Well, number one, thank you for letting me chat with you because this is this is like a, this is my version of, of candy at work. I get a little bit of it, and it's just perfect. And it makes me makes me happy. So, um, hey everyone, I'm Ben Eubanks. I'm the chief research officer at Lighthouse Research and Advisory. It is my job to to understand what's happening in terms of the trends in the the HR and talent marketplace, and also um, what tools and technologies are out there to serve employers. So that the research we do covers those two big, big things. That's a full time job trying to keep up with all of that. In addition to that, uh, I've written a book. Just actually sent in this last week. What a relief! Sent in the the second edition. Uh, changes from my book, Artificial Intelligence for HR, which looks at how AI and automation are going to change the function of HR and how we serve the employee population. And I tell everyone, it's, it sounds very dry. It sounds like a textbook, but it's actually a book about making work more human. And so I'm, I'm excited about that one. And in addition to th those things, the, the thing that really I, I love spending my time with, we have four, four kids, as we were laughing about before we started recording today, we have four kids and uh, just finished a road trip recently. And so if you see any like like uh, tired eyes is probably what it's coming from, but um, it's that's the the best use of my time is is hanging out with our kids. <laughs> that's awesome, um, and I'm gonna I'm definitely gonna ask you a couple of questions about your because that title alone is just exciting to me, and I can't wait to 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 get my hands on it. So, uh, kudos to you because I mean tech, as you know, like and I'll work with Bester, and we're really big on like tech and AI and how it can really make or I work more human essentially. So, but listen, we chatted last time about well-being and performance. And I kind of want to open up the topic from that side because I think well-being in general has become this really big topic in the world of HR and just organizations, right? Like there's been a big push. And I'm I'm just curious of kind of what's what have you seen as changes, you know, prior to COVID, how much was there a focus on well-being versus now? Has that changed, particularly in the US, right? And, and, and then to pick up on that, what do you see as, is there a correlation between well-being and performance in your opinion? So there are like seven questions there. So I'll try to get jump in on, on all of those because they're- Well, I'll, I'll remind gonna, you about that. We'll go back across all of them, I'm quite sure. So I'll start off with, even back when I worked in HR, I didn't go that far back in my background, but I worked in HR for, for years before I stepped out to do the research that I do now. And even when I worked in HR, there was always a little bit of an aspect of, of wellness and well-being. It was primarily cost-driven. It was how do we reduce the, the cost of our healthcare premiums and things like that. And that was the, the biggest focus. Like it was all medical focused. And after that, you know, since then, in the last year especially, more companies are saying, hey, wait a minute, there's there's other layers to this. There's a mental health aspect of it. And I think part of that was actually driven by the fact that leaders who had not had that type of stress in the past suddenly had it and they're like whoa wait a minute this is actually a real thing this isn't just something they're talking about or this is this isn't an hr fad this is a real a real challenge and like stress broadly is is a challenge for people but when you start adding other qualify or other other things on it to make it even more complex and multipliers on top of it um, i remember seeing this study years ago that said if you have like three of these things happen in a year your chance of a heart attack goes up like 50 percent it was like having a death in the family you know buying a new house or making a move like having a new baby like some of those things that just parts of life where they all come together at once suddenly it increases your chances of all these negative health, health outcomes because our bodies just aren't made to process that much change and stress all at once. So I've definitely seen more companies leaning that direction, having conversations about that. I remember the very first, the first webinar that I did last year when the world turned upside down was a session on the hierarchy of needs and how those things we've taken for granted all this time. We assume that when Elena shows up at the office and she's smiling, that she's healthy, her family is taken care of and, and well-fed, right? That they've got all these things just settled. We don't have that proxy of seeing someone in the office anymore to make those assumptions. And again, it's while it's been challenging, I think those sorts of resets of expectations are a good thing. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, and I, I remember it was there was a report uh, that came out in like February 2020 before before the world turned upside down. And it was about priorities of CEOs at that time. I think it was KPMG. And the priorities of CEO at that time was like cybersecurity, et cetera. And talent was like at the bottom list of sort of, uh, you know, focus areas. And then fast forward to August 2020, talent went all the way up and it was the number one priority because of everything that happened. So, and there was a huge piece on that well-being aspect, right? And now people have realized like, hey, like we really need to make sure we're taking care of our people and having the support for them at this time because we've never been in this before. And 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 we've realized, I think it's just as, as, as individuals and organizations that there's something to it and there is a direct impact on the business, right? So, and uh, I think it was Deloitte also that, did a study and they said that the cost of burnout and presentism and leaveism and organization is costing companies over 2300 us dollars per year per employee so that's that's a huge number uh, as, a, as a cost of burnout so i think it's uh, i mean it's it's about time i guess that we're we're talking about these things yes absolutely well the it's always been a problem right you pointed out kind of at the beginning it's always been a problem but it felt like one of those things that was just we got other things to deal with and suddenly you can't, you can't ignore that anymore. And if that's the biggest side effect of what's happened in the last year, the world's gone through, if that's the biggest outcome there is we suddenly we stop assuming things. We stop just expecting that that that's going to go away or that HR or someone's going to handle that, um, that it's someone else's problem. If that's one of the side effects of this, then we'll, that's going to be a win. I think for the, not just for the workforce as a population, but also for employers everywhere. As they start to get, they, feel, they realize, wait a minute, we can still get the things we need to get out of these people that work with us without having to grind them to a pulp or ignore the mental health kind of warnings we're seeing, things like that. There's a lot of opportunity there to really serve them well. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like looking at how can we be proactive versus reactive, because when it comes to mental well-being, it's usually we get into reactive mode, and this is when people actually hit burnout and we have to get the mental health support. But what about being proactive and making sure that we are creating spaces for our, our people in a way that makes sense? And, and like, for example, what you mentioned is that, you know, making work more human, maybe part of that can also be preventive. And, and I want to hear about that in just a bit, but I wanted to kind of loop in the role of HR. So this is kind of new to a lot of organizations right this whole well-being push so who handles it which sh where should it fall under like which department you know like who whose lab does it end and is it managers is it hr who's responsible oh goodness so hr is the one that's that often brings it up because they're always thinking about how to take care of the workforce and as i mentioned earlier it's it often came from this originally that just wellness as a category was like physical wellness are you okay are you at risk of uh of diabetes or of a heart attack or, or other kinds of things. And so we've edged more into this conversation about around well-being more holistically. That also is wrapping in other things besides mental mental well, mental health, like financial wellness and, and other aspects, right? Um, who owns it? HR is still going to be kind of the person stuck with it. But you and I both know that there's there's limited authority and power and saying of control and HR to just make things happen. Mm -hmm. I've been there and no matter how much you close your eyes and you wrinkle your nose and you just like hope for whatever, it's not going to happen. So we've got to have other people in that as stakeholders. And we we just finished some research recently that was outside the scope of this. But one of the things that came that I came away with was those companies that were high performing in there were the ones who built this coalition of leaders throughout the business they're more likely to have better revenue and performance and things like that if they said we're going to make this decision not in a vacuum but with the input and the insight of all these other leaders in the business from the ceo to other line of business experts who can tell us here's how that'll apply here even to including employees and stakeholders in some of these decisions to figure out okay this is what we want to do does that make sense? Is that going to resonate with you? Will you care about that? And I see that that kind of thing playing a part here. You asked about managers. I think absolutely they need to be involved in this and they need to be helping with this. The challenge is managers have a lot of things to do, but I think that yeah. if we can we can help them, give them tools, give them guidance where it's it's easy lift, but it's hey, have you taken hey, Lena, have you taken 2 minutes to do your your breathing your breathing exercise today, right? Or have you in the last 2 hours have you done a 
have you done a quick mental check on what's important now? Are you focusing on the right thing or are you just doing something kind of churning away that's going to stress you out later on? And just helping them to refocus. It's not big, explosive things that are going to be flashy, but it's those little little moments, little behaviors we can help them reinforce. And managers are much better at, at doing that because they're closer to the work being done than we are as HR leaders. Yeah, absolutely. I love I love this whole little micro approach. So this is something we, we believe very much. So just as micro, you know, touch points and consistency, because when you're doing it at micro levels, and like you said, just regular check ins, you know, just making a few minutes and just, you know, helping people create sort of systems, I guess, and processes that work for them individually about making sure that they're not hitting that point of, of, of no return sometimes, right? So, so it, and it's, it's the consistency and the tiny behaviors really play a huge role. Have you seen this been implemented, successful and not successful? Has, been, has there been pushback that maybe in, in, in some capacity if you've seen that happen? So I actually recently had a chance to talk to someone who's a, a mental performance coach of all things. And that's one of the things he was, he was saying when he works with organizations, that's some of the things I've talked about, like the breathing piece, right? It's something that sounds so simple and so easy, but again, there's a lot of evidence. There's a lot of data to show that having a moment where you pause and you reflect or you pause and you breathe intentionally, that it can lower your stress, lower your heart rate, get you back in, in the right frame of mind. We also talk about things like when, W-I-N, what's important now? Stopping when you have a decision point in front of you and choosing the next thing you're going to do intentionally instead of just falling back into this right or falling back into your inbox which is always going to leave you stressed out i've i don't know about you but i've yet to meet someone that said you know what i just finished going through 150 emails and i feel great it's going to be a wonderful day no usually it's oh i've got a headache i'm exhausted like all my good decision making power is gone and so stopping to ask yourself those questions and think about those things in those moments will lead to you making the right choices when you need to make them so, you know, sorry, I'll, I'll get all on my soapbox talking about those kind of things. But oh, I love it, please. <laughs> yeah, well, finding, finding out how you work best, because every person listening to this has a little different flavor of that. The time that they're, that they're on, the kind of tasks they like to do, the things, how they work most creatively. Like all, those, all of us have a little bit different, different version of that. And the challenge, but also the opportunity is finding what works for you. And so I've spent a lot of time in the last few years trying to figure out my unique rhythms and, and ebbs and flows in terms of work. And now I have like specific processes around if I'm, if I'm going to be speaking at a live event, if I'm going to be doing some writing, I know how to structure the day around that. So that those are my critical outcomes for the day so that I don't end the day and have to suddenly, oh yeah, I've also got to do this, this thing and when I'm at my worst or when that's, it's not the best time to do that. And again, those things lead to more stress more challenge, more issues, and the, the work product isn't as good. You talked about it earlier, right? These things are, it's not just hopefully someone's healthy mentally, but if they're not, if they're having struggles, if they're having issues, that's going to lead to an impact on their performance and the performance of the company as a whole. It's going to roll up to that. It's not just happening in its own little vacuum over there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. I mean, the, I mean, the, the, it's it's can be actually that simple it's just creating that process and kind of experimenting of what might work for you and you very rightly pointed out that it's just different for everybody and and i think just investing a little bit of time like a couple of weeks to uh, to kind of play around with a couple of schedules and routines that might work i mean that's so powerful I, i'm a huge routine uh, person in general i otherwise i'm just not productive and it's like you i kind of operate like clockwork um and and it's it really brings a lot of benefit um so where do you see as technology can help us? So give us a little bit of a snippet of kind of what's what's maybe in the book, a couple of things if you wanted to share with us from, from your research there about AI and how it can make us more human as it kind of relates to everything that we're talking about now. Well, you're talking about, you mentioned a minute ago, it's hard to, I believe you mentioned this, unless I was just putting these words in your head, um, in my head, but you talked about how it's hard for us to understand all these different signals or predict. We're, no, you say we're reactive, right? That's what yeah. you said. Okay, I was trying to remember what, what triggered that for me. <laughs> you say we're reactive. It's hard to be proactive. Well, the tools, the systems, they can process information, more, more comprehensive information than we can as a human. They can take more inputs. They can make better predictions. There's a lot more data there than we can consume as humans. And so if we're using tools to help us understand what – what sort of things are happening in the workplace, they can help us figure out, hey, wait a minute, Ben is showing some early signs that he has a mental illness, that he has some other type of 
um, stress related disorder, that there's something going on there because he's there. These are the, the symptoms, the things we're seeing. Whereas a manager, even if they love me, they have my best interests at heart. They're managing six other people. They can't, they, they can't realize that those are actually triggers because again, not just, they're not just a manager. They're also not a mental health professional. They don't have those, the ability to see those things. So what's amazing is those tools, some of them are powered by AI and they allow us to really target the individual and what they need with an, with an intervention that's going to support them and allows us to, to give them the resources they need or, or to give them support or help them unplug for a moment if that's what's needed in the moment. That's what excites me is the tools are getting better, getting smart enough to help us to really tailor how we do this. And for every individual, and it's easy to see the headlines and think, well, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to replace all the the HR professionals are going to take away our jobs. Well, no, it's going to allow us to be more targeted with those moments we have. Instead of saying, well, let's just do, we have 300 employees or 3,000 employees or 300,000 employees. We'll just do a broad, you know, education around mental health when there's a portion of those people that aren't going to read it, that aren't going to care, or that might need it and don't have the time to pay attention to it because they're so stressed out about everything else. And instead saying, no, we're going to do a targeted intervention because we can see that 5% of our employees are exhibiting these signs and we need to support them right now instead of just saying broadly, oh, this is important. It's, let's get right to what they need from us. So that's the kind of things that the book talks about that in a, all these different kind of contexts around how we hire and train and connect with people and everything else. But then mm -hmm. the core of it is like, let those augment what we do as humans to help us be more targeted with the interactions and the conversations that we have with our people. Hmm. And, and I mean, absolutely. And when it comes to just learning and uh, learning in general, like the future of learning, the future of kind of, you know, career growth and, and really taking care of your overall well-being, it's very much individualized. So gone are the days when we put people in one room and we try to teach them something and then they walk away and it's like 7% of that information is actually retained after a week. It's just, you know, it's, it's just not feasible. Um, so technology, I can definitely see how it can help us not only not only uh, you know have that individual support but also makes it accessible and affordable because as i mean we, we know coming from our background is that uh, you know when it comes to certain upskilling or trainings or well-being initiatives it's usually the last on the agenda and the budget right so people you know companies don't really want to spend a lot of money so in fact with technology you know it's it's really becoming even more affordable and cutting everything and and reaching more people as well would you agree I agree. I'm going to tell you a quick story, if you don't mind. Um, I had a friend recently that told me about a time she pitched a wellness program in the worst possible way, and it didn't get approved. And so I'll, I'll tell you this, this story real quick. She was the, the head of HR for this company. She came to her CEO and said, hey, look, here's, our, here's the plan I have for this, this well-being program. Here's, the, here's the, the pretty colors. I've designed all these things. Here's the flyers that we're going to go out. And she spends all this time talking about the design of the program, and he's like, yeah, we're not going to do that. We're not going to invest in that. And she went away so upset and so angry. Like, well, what is he thinking? He doesn't, he doesn't value me. He doesn't value my ideas. And she stopped and kind of reflected for a moment and said, wait a minute. I talked about all these things, like why I'm excited about it. I talked about the stuff, but I didn't talk about the cost, the return. I didn't talk about the impact on the workforce. And so she said, hey, can I, if I can get 20 minutes on your calendar, I just want to come back and share the things I didn't talk about because I realized I did that the wrong way. And she came back and said, here's, here's what it's going to cost. It's going to cost us $1,200 to do this basic thing. It's, here's the benefit I see out of it. If, if one person out of this population makes a change, it's going to be like a 10x savings yep. for us on our health bills, health, uh, health insurance. And when he's like, well, I don't need to hear anything else. Do it. Yeah. Start it yesterday. Like, get started immediately. And so, like, it, it comes back to one of the problems we have with some of these kinds of things, we don't always do a good job of conveying the value it's going to bring. And the first thing that you started out the conversation with is these connect to business outcomes. We can't connect well-being and wellness. It's not a, it's not a soft measure. We can connect how this leads to better outcomes for those people. And so I wanted to share that story because if, if anyone listening into this is like, how do I share that? Don't start with the pretty colors. <laughs> don't yeah. start with why you're excited about it. start with here's the impact on our people here's how we could support them better here's the thing it's going to mean for the company um, in terms of expenses and and, and uh, impact on profitability and other things like that there's so much data and evidence out there that back this up and give you some good numbers to run by and benchmarks things like that that we don't have to rely on it feels like a good idea i think it's good for our people no there's actual evidence we can use instead of that mm -hmm. 
Uh, uh, yeah, definitely. And um, yeah, for better or for worse, at the end of the day, business is business, and and, and it's you know it's essentially about the, the profits or um, you know decreasing of 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 costs, right? But at the end of the day, also business is people. So if you're able to take care of your people, then the business will profit. There was actually another study out of UK done, and they said that for every dollar an employer invests in their employee well-being, they get five dollars back as an employer, right? So and there's there's and it goes into much more detail than that, but there is actual studies like tangible things that now say listen you really do get money back as an employer and you know I mean one report that is you know that comes out every year and it's just mind boggling every single year I'm just surprised we're still there and it's the, the famous Gallup report that talks about the, the disengagement in the workforce you know and, and 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 of course there's a lot of different things about it but still you know I said even if it's a if even if you try to like kind of convert a small percentage of the disengaged workforce which every company has and and, and you know on a larger scale not just well-being but well-being can be many things well-being is you know having is that hierarchy of needs is feeling connected and feeling the long belonged and feeling included in the, in the company right in the in the community of your colleagues and that emotional you know uh, the relationships you have with your colleagues etc so if you just look at that, if you're able to tap into that and kind of address the individual drivers, individual aspects of just overall well-being, then you're able to really get people engaged because, you know, as an employer, you don't gain anything if your people are burnt out or they're, they're you know, they're just there to kind of tick the box. They're not bringing their creative, innovative self to the, to, to the workplace. What do you think about that? Because you Yes, I also said there's, there's <laughs> goodness, there's... I'm glad you brought up some of the other areas beyond just like the, the mental health piece of that. Um, I actually was talking to someone earlier about this and I'm really, I don't know if there's data on this, but I'd love to know it again. If you can't tell of the, by the way, listening, I'm the, the data nerd. I just love knowing all these things. And thankfully Elaine and I are like soulmates because we both love the, love the data. Um, but I'm, one of the things I'm curious about is we, we ask employees for their inputs, right? Feeling like you're heard, feeling like you belong. We ask them for inputs, but oftentimes we don't ever act on them or we don't acknowledge them. And I'm very curious to know, there's probably an, an extinction there. Like if we ask them four times and we don't act on it four times, they'll stop telling us or they'll quit or they'll leave or they'll stop responding. I don't know what the number is. It's probably mm -hmm. a range across the employee population, but that's one of the things you're talking about here. Like if you want to feel valued, you want your employees to feel valued, you want them to feel heard and appreciated. If you ask them a question, we we'll ask them because they, they want to tell you, ask them but if you ask them acknowledge it try to react try to respond otherwise you're missing a chance to really connect with them in a way that that's meaningful and valuable um i don't think anybody is ever going to say i expect every single thing that we we mention here mm -hmm. to be just solved immediately but saying hey I've, I've heard you i understand your input i appreciate you for sharing your perspective that leads to all kinds of amazing outcomes i worked one of the the last hr jobs that i had i worked for a company that acquired another company and the other, the employees we got alongside of the acquisition had never had a company that cared about what they said. So when we asked them, they're like, hmm. like they wouldn't even tell us. They wouldn't, they wouldn't answer questions. They wouldn't respond to surveys. They wouldn't, when I was there in person with them, they're like, I nothing to say. Mm. And eventually we broke those barriers down and they were, they were, when they realized we were actually willing to take action, we weren't just asking them to, to punish them or to find out who was, you know, ratting someone out, but it was like, we want to hear from you because we want to make this place better for you and serve you in that way. And I can still remember the day where that kind of, that light bulb went off for one of the people. Cause he's like, I'm just going to say it. I don't care. Here's what we need. Like, oh, seriously. That's all. Okay. Well, next week, it'll be right back here in your hands. You'll be ready to go. And he, he, he was blown away by that, by that, by that response because he had never worked for a company that actually cared enough to just listen to what they need. And mm -hmm. Again, with lots of fun examples like that, but I'm glad you brought up the piece about listening to our people, making them feel like they're included, making them feel like they're they're part of this bigger conversation. Yeah. Because I think that's one of the challenges that exist is when there's this separation, whether it's a physical separation or whether it's just a an ignorance or I, I, we can we can call it all kinds of things. Sometimes it's intentional, sometimes it's intentional disregard, sometimes it's accidental. We don't know what the, what's going on, but when there's a different perception at the levels of leadership at the top from what's happening in the rest of the organization, there's always gonna be some additional measure of stress, some additional measure of distrust. Right? Um, one of our friends calls it the CC effect where you have to CC 10 people on your emails because you don't know who you can trust and who you can't. So you gotta cover your rear end when you're sending a message. <laughs> but it's like those things come out as signals of 
poor, poor organizational health overall. Yeah, I mean, that psychological uh, safety aspect is very important. And I think, you know, and that's very easy to, I mean, you can even see this, you know, sometimes if you go into companies, you know, as an external consultant or something, you can always see it play out when people are get really quiet real fast, when you can read the body language and the vibe in the room, but then people are not speaking up um, when like, you know, managers in the room or something like that. And, and it's interesting because sometimes as an external person, when you go into a company and the employees are just like, it's like they're waiting for somebody to ask them what's happening. And they just kind of like let the floodgates open. And then you're like, whoa, like what's happening. But then the manager management have no idea and you're like what's like how is this how is this happening you know but then to be fair a lot of companies I think struggled with this in recent years because we went digital and we lost that that you know coffee break kind of interactions where you can have those opportunities so now we have to be so much more intentional especially for those companies that have uh, brought a new staff right during the pandemic brought out new staff didn't get a chance to see them face to face i mean and in, in the us for example there's a huge push for remote work you're now hiring people that are in different parts of the us that you might not even meet in person until every quarter or, or twice a year and i think that is so important that face to face slight interaction at some level because that also creates that trust climate right and that's when Th things come out and that's how you build that trust so that you can have that psychological safety so where you can speak up and be like mm, excuse me i'm struggling or etc it's 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 in those moments it's what's fun is some of those things you've talked about you talked about a few minutes ago you mentioned people being able to feel like they could bring their best self to work and they could be their most innovative and creative self um, the psychological safety aspect of that there was some really fascinating data from Gallup years ago that said if you are engaged at work and you're really connected and, and happy in the work you're doing, you're like nine times more likely to, to say that work brings out your best ideas, and your best creativity. But if you're not connected, you're not excited about it, you're like, nah, not really. You know, yeah. it's like 9% of people, nine out of 100 people say my work brings out the best if they're not engaged and excited about their work. And so those, again, all these things are in this like this little uh, ecosystem of how those things play out. And I think I've said it a couple of times now, this doesn't happen in a vacuum. Everything we do, every decision we make has multiple outcomes. There's one we're thinking about and four others that we're not thinking about that are somehow related to it. And so thinking about some of things you're talking about here where we're asking for input, we're, we're trying to make people feel like they can really tell us what's going on. There's a book that I read years ago called The Respect Effect. And I, I wish I had the quote right in front of me to read it because it's powerful, but it essentially says when the psychological safety piece is their definition there where it says when someone feels like they are respected and appreciated, they will not just show up, but they will show up with everything they've got because they're not having to spend a portion of their mental energy ready to deflect whatever, wherever that attack is going to come from. They're mm -hmm. ready to give everything that they've got. And I, that, that picture that paints is so powerful. Yeah. No, that, that, that is that is absolutely powerful. And it, to me, it's really, it's unacceptable in my book that, you know, nine out of a hundred people, only nine feel feel connected. And, you know, this is kind of what, when I see these reports every year and I'm like, how is this not changing? So, and that's part of what we're trying to solve, you know, as professionals in this, is this particular piece is like, how can we get more people excited about work? How can we get employers and employees to work together as partners to align individual goals and aspirations and motivations with, with, with organizational goals? And I think now is the, some of the best times to do it because things are changing and transforming and there's more opportunities than ever for us to actually get creative in the way that we work and how we work and in and what career paths we create in organizations um because everything's just becoming so melted together like you know gone are the job descriptions right like now the powers and the person who's able to kind of move around across different departments and really you know, just drive the business forward. So, and granted, it, it, it might be easier done in smaller to medium sized companies versus the larger corporations. But I, I do see that there is an opportunity for us to to get that number uh, from nine, nine people out of 100, a little bit, uh, you know, up the, up the ladder. So, um, um, listen, final point I kind of want to cover is coming, you know, from, from the Middle East uh, in terms of work experience, you know, what's interesting, and I'm curious to hear from the US perspective, what's interesting in the Middle East is that particularly within this well being, first of all, it's a very much a taboo topic, for like mental well being, particular, right? Like it's very new, like it's very new, like it's there's, you know, it's like, it's, it's almost not discussed employees don't speak up. It's like shame to talk about it. It's now starting to pick up and come out. And also as employers, 
Um, well, also on the employee side, there's also that piece of a little bit of, of um, you know, fear of losing the job because in places like the UAE, for example, everybody is on a visa. So, I mean, unless you're a citizen of the country, which is a 10% of the population, right? The rest, it's a 90% expat population. So if you're not on a visa, you have like a month and you got to go. So, and you know, and there's, you know, it's, it's not like it's so simple to just leave. There's a process. So there's that fear of losing job, which makes it even more fearful for people to speak up. And we see it, and this is even individuals working in multinational companies with headquarters, like in places like Dubai, but it's still a very big factor um, in, in terms of just, um, just people speaking up and really, really kind of bringing those challenges forward. So, um, and, and, and yeah, I'm just curious to hear like, do you, I mean, obviously the U.S. is much more progressed in this space, but how does culture play a role here in the U.S.? I mean, I don't know. I mean, U.S. is a huge country, of course, different cultures everywhere. Like, do you see that or is it pretty kind of standard um, across all states, all different uh, companies? That's, that's a big question. We could probably spend another 30 minutes just on that one itself. I'll say that the companies who are most likely to be receptive to this message, this conversation you've had today, who will have an HR leader that will say, yes, I am in and I am, you know, all for this. Those companies are much more likely to, to prioritize talent overall. Yeah. It won't just be like, okay, we're a normal company, but we also care about well-being. No, it's, we care about our people. We're always looking for ways, as we talked about in the conversation today, to listen to them, to get the voice of the employee, to understand how we can serve them better, to, to really get at the root of their needs oh, and we're doing this thing as well because it's just a part of that bigger picture of how much we care about and support the workforce we have. That's what I see broadly. Um, I talked to a company recently that like the average number you see kind of bandied about is one HR person to every 100 employees. This company had 67 employees and four HR people. And I said, well, that's, that's unheard of. And it, it came around to, well, we care about our people so much that we're, we're investing in this twice as heavily as other companies because we want to be twice as good on our HR front. We want to serve them twice as well because everybody else just kind of assumes it's going to be taken care of or they, they put the, ba the bare minimum amount into it. But they said, we found that this has a definite return for us and that's why we're doing this so heavily. And that, that just excites me to think about companies like that. So again, their culture there, very employee centric. They have lots of tool, tools and resources and benefits and perks and things like that available to the employees because they're trying to make sure they take care of them. At the same time, I could probably, you know, 10 minute drive could run across a company that's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I need my people to get back to work. And there's still opportunities there to educate them on the benefits of having people who are really connected in. Sometimes it's hard to do that with, with just evidence. There's you and I, so there's, there's this mounting, amount of, of data and evidence to support that. Mm -hmm. But the good thing is in the last year, many of these managers suddenly were like, oh, wow, I'm feeling this, a different level, level of stress, a different level of um, anxiety than I have in the past. And suddenly they, they realized this is a real thing because it does in fact impact how you're able to work and the ability to be productive and the ability to be creative. All those things are hampered by when you have those other things hanging over your head. Mm -hmm. And again, these, these leaders suddenly realize like this isn't just a thing they deal with. It's a problem that we deal with. And when that, sh that shift happens, that's, that's one other way that it hits, not just on a logical level, but on an emotional level. And that's often how decisions get made. Yeah, absolutely. It's a good one. It's a good one. I like it. Listen, one more question for you, because I, I mean, I thought it would be good to stop here, but I still have one more question for you. If you had a magic wand from an HR perspective and kind of, you know, knowing what you, if you had a magic wand when it comes to well-being or making work more human, what would that look like? What would you make happen? Wow. That is a Take really me. interesting question. That <laughs> is a really that. interesting question. So if I could change anything about work, I would enable managers to care about the people just as much as they care about the work getting done. I think that would change everything. Mm -hmm. the, the leaders, if you think about right now, think about a leader that you had that was, that appreciated you, that recognized your great work, that always is thinking about how can I level up this stuff and elevate your story because you're doing great things. Those leaders that do those things, they're few and far between. And if every manager was that good, 
that's the thing that I would change. I think they would care about their people on a new level and it would enable some of these things that you, you and I talk about and we fight against and we try to advocate for. It wouldn't just be HR sounding the alarm on that, but it would be managers across the population saying our people need something else that we need to serve them with. And the tools we have right now aren't getting that done. We've, this is another gap we have. And that would just be, I can't even imagine what that would look like, but it'd be pretty tremendous mm -hmm. to see. That is amazing. Yeah, I think that's it. I think this is it. If we're just able to help managers care about their people as much as they care about getting the work done. I think that's powerful. I think that's it. <laughs> Listen, where can people find you? I know you have a, a, an amazing LinkedIn and I follow your stuff and your content. Is there anywhere else? Uh, I'll share your website as well for, for, for your company. Is there anywhere else that people can follow you and kind of get engaged with you? Definitely LinkedIn's the best place. I'm, I'm most active there. Um, if you go to thebenubanks.com, pretty easy there you can see kind of a, a host of different things that I do the book and research and all the kind of fun things and so I'd love to to connect or chat more if someone wants to know more about some of the things that we do around research I just as you can tell in this conversation this is how I talk normally I love this stuff and I love to get a chance to to kick back ideas kick around ideas about how this stuff how we can create a workplace that truly is more human and better serves the population. I got, again, I mentioned at the beginning, I've got lots of kids coming up in the workforce at some point, and I want I want a workplace that they're excited to go into and not a place that treats them like we're, we're renting their skills for a few dollars a, a week or a few dollars a month. I want them to, to work for a place that really cares about them and their mental health. Awesome. I look forward to reading your book. Looking forward to it, absolutely, as well, definitely. Thank you. Good stuff. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yes, ma'am.